Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. So uh, should we start, get the, get the conversation yeah. started here, get the program yeah. started? Absolutely. All right. So we're going to have Daniel, our esteemed colleague here and uh, member of Floating Piano Factory in New York City, uh, read the bio for Steve, and then he'll tell you a little bit about Piano Technician's Master Classes quickly, and then uh, we'll, we'll pretty much launch. And uh, just before he does that, I want to thank all the people working behind the scenes, Pooja, we have Tal, we have Mikolai, we have Ian, we have Daniel, uh, we have Patrick, we have Sarah. A lot of people working behind the scenes to make this happen. So, so thank you all very much for being here. Thank you so much. You make it um, seamless and beautiful. Thank you. Yes, yes. Can't do it without you. So yeah, go ahead. Hit it, hit it Daniel, with our, our bio of our guest today, Steve Brady. Hey, everyone. Um, so Steve, our guest today, uh, is an award-winning piano technician and respected PTG veteran. In tw 2012, he was included in the PTG Hall of Fame. In 2016, he was awarded the PTG's Golden Hammer Award, one of his profession's yeah. highest honors for his contributions in the piano industry. He's the author of Under the Lid, The Art and Craft of the Concert Piano Technician, and he resides in Seattle, Washington. And we're very happy to have Steve with us today. And... Um, Yep. Hey, I'd also like to, hey, yep. to let you know that the Piano Tech Radio Hour is being brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. And you can find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com slash PTM 2020. Can I just jump in on the back of that for a minute? Yeah, of course biased contributor and supporter of Piano Technician's Masterclass. Ethan Janney, right here, up in the corner, is the only entity, Piano Technician's Masterclass is the only entity in the world that's actually literally looking forward in the 21st century and uh, providing high definition audio and broadcast quality video recordings for our community. And so I just want to give him huge props for that. The only entity, no other guild, no other organization of piano tuners, any place is really attempting to do that, that I know of. If I'm wrong, then please correct me with the data that I'm missing. But I just want to, I just want to give props to Ethan and Piano Technicians Masterclass. I've had, I don't know, half a dozen calls in the last two months about uh, from from technicians that have somehow gotten a hold of the it paid or for the for the for a couple of, some of the recordings in the library and they've called to sing the praises of of how cool that is to just have that information in your computer that you can just look at and watch it's it's amazing anyway that's it end of rant. Thanks, David. And in the interest of our guest here, we'll, we'll jump right into the episode with Steve. And today's episode is going to be a very special, different thing we haven't done before. Ask me anything. You can ask Steve Brady anything. And uh, if, it's, uh, if it's off limits, we'll just let you know. We'll bypass it. But I think pretty much everything's on the line. <laughs> um, and we got some questions ahead of time. So maybe I'll jump in with the the first one that I that I can there, and the first question was uh, perhaps someone could ask Mr. Brady if he knows what causes key leads to decompose into a white powder. It only happens. It kind of sounds like a mystery, like a Sherlock Holmes mystery. It only happens in some pianos and not others. I had a piano which only the black keys were affected. Others only bass keys. Many thanks, and that's from Norman Brown. I don't know if Steve has an answer, but if he does, that'd be very interesting. What do you have, Steve? Okay, well, first of all, is it just me or are other people experiencing breakups in the audio? 
it's just you. It's just you. We're doing pretty good. Okay. Um, wow. Well, if it gets bad enough, I'll run and get my Ethernet cable and and plug it into my computer. Sounds good. We can hear you just fine, so you can. You talk. can hear me. Okay. Well, let's and talk. Your heart's content. Um. Yeah. Well. Okay, when I see this, uh, this white powder on key leads, and sometimes it gets really extreme and it even makes the leads swell up. Uh, yep. I've always assumed <clears throat> that it's uh, some kind of oxidation. And technically it turns out that uh, it's not, if it's white, it's probably not an oxide of lead. It's, it's another compound probably it, it's uh, lead carbonate. Now I'm not a chemist or anything, but there is a difference. Uh, uh, lead oxides are often used as uh, uh, pigments in paints, or I mean, they used to be before we, we sort of outlawed that sort of thing. But uh, true lead oxides tend to be yellow and orange and red. And uh, Lead carbonate is white, and that that is used as a pigment in white paints. Okay, the difference is in what causes these compounds to form. Uh, oxides, it's always oxidation, and uh, you know that can that's mostly going to be from the lead getting wet or too much humidity. Uh, lead carbonate is formed in the presence of carbon dioxide and humidity. I don't know if that really helps us understand why some keys, uh, you know, the leads develop this stuff and others they don't. Uh, for instance, why the black keys would do it and, and uh, the white keys wouldn't. Uh, as far as that goes, there may be uh, uh, some other agent that's acting on the lead. For instance, maybe uh, if the leads on some of the keys, like the black keys are sealed with a different compound, it might react with the lead differently. I, I don't know. And, and as to why it would just be the base keys, it's anybody's guess. But the, the one thing you can really control is the humidity. And the, the less humidity, the less likelihood there is of developing these, these compounds on lead. I hope that helps. Uh, Steve, if, if you come upon this issue and the leads are either expanded out or white powderish, what is your protocol for mitigation? It depends on how bad they are. Uh, yeah. If it's you know, just kind of a light dusting, I might try to seal the lead with a, like a spray lacquer or something. If they're really bad to the point, I've seen them where the leads expand so much that- yep. They uh, bind the keys. They start splitting the keys even. Yeah. Uh, in that case, you take them out yep. and, and put in new leads because there's really not much else you can do. Well, I've heard about people you know, dremeling them down and then putting epoxy or some kind of, you know, permanent kind of sealant in there. But uh -huh. you're right. If if they're growing and splitting and rubbing and binding, best thing to do is just knock the lead out of there and put it. Put I, th I think it's it's probably faster than trying to grind them down and seal them and stuff. Plus, you know, you're exposed to toxic stuff when you're grinding lead. Uh, Ethan, next question. Sure, let's hit the next one. Okay, heading back here. Also, um, we'll try to put the link in the chat later. It'd be great to have some advance notice of that kind of thing, but there's a, a Spanish language uh, sort of online lecture coming up in an hour. So we'll try to put that link in, give you, give you guys that opportunity to check that out. Okay, next question. Um, I would like to have a discussion on how to deal with loose tuning pins, especially in the bass section. Uh, sounds like a specific piano is using it as an example, was kept in a poor environmental conditions for several years in an open veranda in a hotel 
with a wet inland uh, breeze blowing towards it. An event organizer has purchased a piano and is now kept inside a hall under good conditions. Unfortunately, I have noticed that several tuning pans are getting loose. Can we take up this issue in our discussions? Yeah, well, and that, that's from Clement Kanji, and he's on an island nation in the Indian Ocean. Which, oh, wow. Yeah, wow. I know he has tons of problems with humidity. So he said huge uh, swings in humidity, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Or just uh, overwhelmingly high humidity all the time, probably. I would imagine. But then for the pins to get loose indicates that, that the humidity may have gone the other way, too. Point uh, well, okay, so it, to me, it depends on how loose the pins are. I mean, if they are so loose that they don't even come close to holding, yeah. you replace them. And uh, you may, you really want to check out the pin lock and make sure that there's no cracks in it. Uh, Tip-offs about cracks in the pin block or delaminations would be that you have a bunch of tuning pins all in one area that that are loose like right next to each other or they're all in a straight line that's a real tip off uh, but if you're not getting that and say they're just barely holding or barely not holding uh, i don't think there's a better quick solution than ca uh, the ca glue very thin, like water thin CA, you can drip it in there. And the beautiful thing about it is, even if there are some little cracks, it will, it will tend to seep in and seal them. Uh, whereas, you know, in the old days, we used to, if, if we had a, a few loose tuning pins, we would put in oversized pins just on those. And if there's any cracks, you know, it's just going to make them worse. So uh, I really like the CA for, for that. You know, if it's really extreme and it's throughout the whole piano, the obvious solution is to put in a new pin block. But I know that, that uh, you know, budgets don't always allow for that. So, but the CA is, is quick, easy. It's so much better than the old um, pin block restorers, they used to call them that, uh, you know, would just gunk up the pin block and the tuning pin feel would get bad. With the CA, you don't have that problem. There's been technicians in the United States that have been using CA for just that purpose for a quarter century and have followed those pianos. And there's literally, I mean, you can't say never because perfection doesn't exist, but hardly ever a failure or any issue at all. And right. all you have to do is Google CA glue piano and you get everything you need. There's, there's, there's technicians that have been doing it for a long time. And they'll tell you exactly how to do it. Yeah. And so, but it's the water thin variety that you want to use so that it really penetrates well. Yes, um, wicks. And uh, what I do is just, uh, I'll use a, like a hypo oiler and just, you know, put in drops at the base of the tuning pin as far from the string itself as I can get. And you do it slowly and watch. And when, when the hole around the tuning pin appears to be filling up, then you're, you're probably good. Okay, next. Next question. I'm just going to add a quick follow-up because I've, I've seen a little bit of this. I don't really hear anybody talking about it. want to know if you think it's a bad idea or it's just something, you know, that's not optimal. But I, I hear some people putting something, they actually remove the tuning pit and put something else in there. Like a, I've heard like a sandpaper or there's even some sort of like gridded up material yeah. that you could put in there. Is that kosher? Or have you seen any experience? Kind of, this is old school too. Um, you know, we all used to do that in the old days. But again, if yeah. you shim a hole and there happens to be any cracking at all, you're just going to make that worse over the long haul. So, I, I, you know, I don't use a lot of CA glue in my work because I've developed a sensitivity to it and it causes respiratory problems. But I got to tell you, this is the one thing I do use, use it for. Oh. Uh, 
also, well, I would say I also use it for hairline cracks around bridge pins, but when I do it, I wear a respirator. Mm, because good to know. I have trouble for several days afterwards. Uh, someone else had talked about, is it, why not just tap the pins further into the pin block? Um, the reason that's not the best solution is because what you're doing is just tightening the pin up at the very bottom. And it's, it's going to affect the tuning pin feel and it's not going to last that long. It's, it's kind of a, the only time I would do this is if I'm in the field, I don't have any water thin CA with me and I've got some pins that just aren't holding. It's like they're just barely not holding. Then you can tap them in, but you want to support the pin lock when you do that and then come back later with CA. Oh, thank you. So, but I, I, we, we need to ask the next question, but I want to encourage everybody in the sound of my voice. I'm challenging you to ask the question maybe you're afraid to ask or a question that has been bothering you for a long time and you don't know the answer, but you're kind of shy of saying it, ask it. And this is, we have a priceless opportunity here with somebody that's been doing this for way longer at a way higher level than most of us. And it's really a tremendous opportunity to get showered with information. That's it. Oh, uh, okay. David um, asked, uh, he, he says he agrees about using a respirator and he wants to know what sort of respirator I use. So I'm just going to run into the shop and bring it back and show you. Cool. That's cool. Cause there, there's a few more comments here too. I can just read from Cy Schuster. He said, if you use a hypodermic denal to apply it carefully, um, yeah, that's no? what I do. okay. Keep a Q-tip handy to stop trips or else you can glue a damper to the string. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> okay, this uh, is my respirator. Wow, that was quick, Steve. Well, my shop is right next door to my office. So. It makes you look so, like a huge insect. It's awesome. It does, it does, you know. Okay. <laughs> But it seems uh, to it seems to solve the problem of the fumes. Wow! You know. So yeah. you don't feel messed up for two days afterwards when you use the respirator? Right? No, no. Awesome, awesome. Someone else asked about pin tight, um, and it's say they say it's more popular in Europe in comparison to CA glue. Mm. Pin tight is a very old formula. I have never used it myself, so I can't really speak. Uh, to that with authority, but I do know that one of the ingredients in pintide is potato juice. Hmm. Whatever. So just go straight to the source. <laughs> <laughs> have, you ever tried... seen, have you ever seen a piano treated with pintide? It's horrific. Hmm. I literally... I've tried it a few times. It didn't, didn't, there was, I didn't seem so spectacular, but it's greasy. again, it was just a couple nasty. times. It's nasty. That's just complete ignorance. My oh, European Paul is, is asking about, oh, Paul is asking about loose bridge pins with CA. I do, uh, I do use it on uh, bridge pins uh, if, if they're at all loose. Uh, you will, and you can apply it with the strings on, but you just have to be really careful. Put one drop at a time at the base of the bridge pin on the side opposite from the string. And it does help with false beats. It also improves the tone. So if you're, if you're trying to get a stronger tone, uh, a clearer tone, it, it, it's good for that. Especially in the top three octaves, especially in yeah, the top three especially. Adds, so. adds, adds noticeable system if the pins are loose and then you tighten them up. And this is why I agree with Cy. Schuster, you, you need a, I, I could never get the, you know, piano commercial house uh, hypo oilers to get uh, fine enough for me. I use a disposable large bore syringe and I'm just so, it's so much more controllable for me, for my crazy hand. Um, so that's my suggestion. Buy a whole bunch of them and it's like 12 cents a piece. Mm -hmm. Are, are these like uh, insulin syringes? Yeah, big, large bore needles. 
Oh, you know, large bore needles. Yeah, lar large bore needles that 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 uh, well can be any size you want, but just get big bore needles, not huge, but so that uh, that you know you can spend about two times, and your hand will remember. Oh, this is the amount of pressure I need for one beautiful drop, and mm -hmm. you'll never have a problem again. Yeah, for years I used a veterinary syringe. It was a glass. Syringe, you know, with yeah. a lot more needle, and that you know, finally it broke. But uh, yeah, uh, now I have one. I think I got at the woodworking store. Uh, yeah, it's a very large syringe with a a large bore needle, and it works great. That's right, and you can just order them online by the box, uh, so no problem. I saw Paul. Uh, I think it's Paul Williams. I'm not sure where the first name is, but he said he was he was holding something up to the screen there. So yeah, Paul Williams. Oh. oh. Yeah. Well, he's that's a hypo oiler. It's got a hypo oiler. Yeah. 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 That for my hands, that's not. It's not specific enough. God bless you, Paul, uh, for being able to use that uh, uh, accurately. I can't. I the the, the the one drop thing. That's what I use for for one drop voicing on hammers too. You know, just when I want to plink, plink, plink. Each one of the straight points. Oh. These. Uh, Oh, Ed Whitting is asking me uh, what brand and model my respirator is. It's uh, MSA. MSA. And uh, I don't see a model number, but the, the cartridge looks like 1814. <laughs> Sounds helpful. Now that yeah. we have the internet kind of thing's pretty easy. By the way, I just wanted to say, because Paul was uh, uh, showing um, showing some things, I, I had some comments from people earlier in, in the feedback forms. They were like, you know, when they're doing the Zoom call and it's, it's jumping around from speaker to speaker or, or it gets uh, it kind of confusing. So you can actually, if you're on Zoom with us, then you can choose in your settings who you view. If you, if you want to click on one of the people, you can pin their video so you can see exactly what they're doing all the time. Or you can um, you can choose speaker view in the upper right hand corner. You can also choose grid view where it shows everybody. But uh, yeah, just to know you do have some flexibility here if you're in the Zoom call. And if you're there out on Facebook or YouTube, we just send, uh, we have one of our, actually Daniel's our sort of camera angle man and he tries to show you the best the best image of what's going on here. So so yeah, we've got some added features here you can you can enjoy. I'm going to move on to the, another question from the past, and then we'll start moving on to questions that came in during the session. Thanks to the people who have submitted questions ahead of time. This actually really makes, you can do this at any, for any of our sessions. It, it really makes it easier to make an agenda and cover exactly what you want to hear. Yeah, so this thank question- Thank you very much, folks. Yeah. This question for, was from- for thoughtfulness. Definitely. And proactivity is, is useful. David Lilledal, Lil I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, he says, hi, Steve, string leveling in the field. Is there an oral red flag that alerts you to check this out? Uh, your favorite tool and procedure? And that's from David Lilladal. Okay. Great question. That's a great question. Uh, yes, there is an oral red flag. And, you know, once you've identified it, you hear it very easily. But, it, you know, it, it, you have to listen to the sound in a very specific way. But the way I describe the red flag sound is the note is both weak and twangy. <laughs> Those two things. Exactly. It's weak and twangy. If it's just weak, it's probably not um, uh, a problem with... And, and I have to say, when we say string leveling, there's two reasons why you get this problem. One is that the strings are not level with each other, but the other one is that the top of the hammer is not level. And, and the, the resulting sound is the same for both conditions. So you first have to determine if it's a string leveling problem or a hammer leveling problem. So, uh, yeah, but anyway, it, you need to listen very specifically. And I, where, where you find this problem the most tends to be in the tenor section. 
And I think it's because everything is angled there. The, the A graphs are angled, the strings are angled, the hammers are angled. But uh, I'm always super careful in the tenor section to get every, all of the hammers mated to the strings. Um, I'll show you some tools I like to use. Ooh, show and tell, this is exciting. This is fantastic, literally. I can't believe we're doing this. This is. By the way, we have um, one of one of Steve's piano textures is master classes lectures is uh, on tools, and uh, it's really cool. He has a vintage toolkit that he picked up somewhere, and he kind of brings out all these ancient tools, and you know, talks about this story of how he figured out what the heck they did and stuff like that. It's pretty. That was pretty fun. <laughs> if you want to go to piano technology graduate school like small group doctoral things, check out Mr. Brady's Piano Technician's Masterclass. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, so this is the, the first tool I like to use. And this is for leveling strings. And it's basically uh, a float. Wow, is that Charlie Falk's tool? Yes, this is Charles Falk's tool for leveling strings. It is so much better than a bubble level. The bubble level, the problem is you're trying to level the strings to the floor or to the earth or whatever. Uh, and the problem with that is there are areas in the piano where you are not going to be able to do that and, or areas where you shouldn't do that because you're gonna be forcing things. So recognize that the, the string plane is crowned. Mm. This is because the plate casting is crowned. So the beauty of this tool is that it rests on the adjacent strings. And if there's any crowning at all, and the, the tool tilts to accommodate that. Oh, I love nice. this tool. So Charles Falk, okay, he has um, another <clears throat> tool that the nice thing about this tool, see if I can get you to see the end of it. Okay. There you go. So it has a groove in the end and you can either lift a string with this or if a string is high, you can actually lower it, push it down because it provides its own leverage. I, I would say use this tool with caution. Uh, I normally use a string hook and, I, and I'm raising the strings rather than lowering them. But there are occasions where I'm trying to raise the two low strings and they won't raise high enough. And then the only thing you can do is <clears throat> lower the high string. And with, you know, with a regular string hook, that's impossible. Or with just a tool that will push down, you can't lower a string. But with this tool, you can. So I use it sparingly, only when absolutely necessary. And the reason I say that is because if you, if you move the string down more than just a little bit, you'll be able to see a little kink in the string. I've never been able to hear a difference as a result of that kink but I don't like the way it looks. So again, use it very sparingly, but when you need this tool, it is the only thing that works. Mm. Okay, if- So uh, can, you, can you tell us what is your uh, preferred uh, kind of string hook? Yeah, um, let's see here. You can't actually buy this anymore but I've had mine forever. And there's a guy in Colorado named Glenn Hart who, who makes the best string hook ever. That's right, it's such a drag that, it, that it's not being made. Yeah, made. Um, and it's, it's made out of a single piece of mild steel that he has bent into the shape. So the handle is here, the hook is here and it's very slender. Mm -hmm. So we can get in between the strings and 
at the other end, you've got a tool for pushing the string down, like just to seat it on the bridge like this. I love this tool. And Glenn told me he stopped making them because a few people were too energetic with them and they would break the tip off because he has hardened the tip a little bit. And uh, but that's, all that's say a, is I have had mine for decades and I've never broken it. I love it. That's an that's a ignorance and education issue. Yeah. I think no, you're right. If you're pulling that hard, you're 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 that's a huge red flag. Yeah. Well, and uh, I think that the key is it's not so much how hard they're pulling, it's that they'll put it in between the strings and turn it and snap off the very tip. Jeez. So you just have to use some care. You know, all tools need to be used with care. Um, okay, now if we've determined that the strings are level, how do we deal with the other end? That, that's the hammer. Uh, and my favorite tool for this is, is a curved sand file. These are homemade. But the beauty of the curved sand file is that you don't have to take, you know, a straight file and be kind of getting down to the side of the hammer and making sure that everything's curved. And uh, it, it just, this is a lot more work. And the beauty of this tool is it's, it's idiot proof. <laughs> you don't have, to, you don't, you know, you, you don't go like this over the hammer. It's not like this. You go like this. And the curvature of the tool itself keep maintains the curvature on the top of the hammer. It's a beautiful tool and it's so fast, you know, you, you can just, in two or three strokes, you can level a hammer up. Wow. So I highly recommend this. I think I uh, once measured the radius of this, uh, of this curve, and I can't remember how, how big it was, but it, you know, it's obviously a lot bigger than the top of a hammer. But the reason it works is it, it cuts when you reach this point in the stroke and this point. So it maintains a proper curve on top of the hammer. Wow. Love this tool. Say this, so. be, this, this is a whole class. This is a whole doctoral, you know, class on, on getting things level, man. What? So I, I put, um, I have two that I use a lot. One has, I think this is something like 320 grid and the other one is 500 grid. And it works great. So, so, so you're just lightly going over the top of the piano that with a really super light touch, right? Right like over this. the top, the flat part and the curved part, everything. Yes. Straight, oh. straight line. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to do this. It's straight line, in and out, in and out. And you're just lightly following the contour of the of, of the hammer. You're not. There, there's no pressing or uh, or anything like that, right? No, if you're just trying to level out the top of the hammer, there's no need to take off a lot of felt. Right. And uh, in many cases, especially with uh, hard pressed hammers, I, I just go with the 500 grit. Uh, with soft pressed hammers, sometimes I need a little, you know, a little stronger grit to, uh, to do those. So I start with the 320 and then finish with the 500. So uh, everybody wants to know, then what is your final method of checking the hammer to string mating? You pluck strings, uh, you, how do you force the hammer to the strings, all that oh, stuff. Oh, okay. I'm glad you asked that. By the way, I just put in uh, both of Steve's, links to both of Steve's lectures uh, on PM Tech and National Classes. I, I remember correctly, uh, he, he shows how to use uh, many of these tools and demonstrates these tools in maybe some of them in both lectures and, and at least the art of voicing he 
uh, he, he does some of these voicing tools and the filing tools and things like that. Okay, so bringing the hammer to the string and blocking it. Um, you know, I've, I can use all different methods and I've, I'm, I've gotten pretty good at doing it with just rocking the jack and pushing the hammer up into the string. Uh, but you know, the hammer, the, the action has to be in really close regulation for that to work. Um, That's right. The problem with a string hook for me is that I always lose it in my case. I have a hard time finding it. And, and it's just one more tool to juggle. So what I've been doing lately, do you know this tool? No. This is the Fazioli style between the strings voicing tool. Uh, oh yeah, I have one of those. i sorry, my glasses weren't on. That's a good tool. I love this tool uh, for many reasons. One, one is that since the, uh, the business end is so slender, yep. you can actually see what you're doing down there between the strings. Whereas, you know, a traditional chopstick tool, it, the, the tool itself is so thick, sometimes it hides. Right, three, four you know, times as thick as that. Yeah, it, it hides the point of attack and you, you can't see it. So uh, I just discovered that I can use this to, to just kind of poke the front of the hammer and lift it up to the string. It saves so much time to only be using one tool. Uh, and you don't have to make a hook or change anything. You just, wow. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's so that, brilliant. This has been my go-to tool for, for, you know, fine voicing between the strings and also bringing the hammer up to the strings to block it. So that's, uh, that's it. So you step on the Sosta noodle pedal, you, first the damper pedal, or, or no, you play the note, step on the Sosta noodle pedal, and then just raise the hammer up and pluck the strings. Wow. Perfect. I have a, another question from before the lecture, and then uh, if we need to, we'll move on to things that, that came up um, in the chat here. Um, the question is from Greg Lynch, and it is, would, from Steve Brady, he would like to know, in, in your career, how many vertical pianos have you performed full regulation and voicing procedures? That's a great question. That is a great question. Uh, and uh, for me, actually, the answer is I can probably count the number of uh, verticals that I have fine regulated and voiced on the fingers of one hand. Uh, the main reason being that I, I just don't work on that many verticals. So uh, yeah, I have certainly done the process with a few, but uh, you know, the guy to, to ask about this is uh, Fred Sturm. No kidding. You know, Fred uh, is a great technician and he's, uh, he has protocols for you know, doing fine hammer fitting and voicing on vertical pianos. I, you know, he has the whole thing mapped out. But, uh, and in fact, I've used some of his ideas on the rare occasions where I've, I've had to do that with a vertical. Cool. I'll, I'll throw in that I've done a handful of upright um, regulations and I definitely do voicing that was the other part of the question. I think voicing on uprights that came up in the lecture with uh, with Boaz Kirschenbaum. He highly recommends you know just doing voicing on every piano at least a little bit, uh, whether it's something you're just testing something out or you know a small thing that you can do to sell the customer on. One thing about voicing is the client notices you know after you do it a lot of times, so it's it's kind of a nice way to send them off and actually make, can make your tuning sound better. Um, yes. On, on, on almost any piano. So uh, so I've done some voicing on uprights. That's in New York City, you know, and, and a bit in Chicago. So I think people are inclined to have smaller pianos. And so I mean, they maybe they'd be willing to do that work on the smaller pianos because they have to have them in the small quarters. Uh, right. But yeah, also up, upright regulation, you can really achieve a lot. You can make these pianos a lot better than they are. A, a lot of uprights are neglected and they have a lot more potential than people that own them realize if you could show them they'll they'll just be so tickled you know 
That's right. And and Fred Sturm is a master of the vertical piano. Jim Busby is also the ma um, a master. Vin Vince Mercolo is also a master of the vertical piano. If you contact any of these men, uh, they're, they'll be more than happy to give you their protocols or to guide you to some place where you can read them or copy them. Yeah, and I think um, I think some of these have appeared in the journal. I, I know um, Fred published a, a great article on doing fine uh, regulation and voicing on uprights. It, it was a, a while back. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Bill Monroe, a younger uh, generation guy, is really good. Really, really a great technician. And has a published series of articles about how to deal with uh, vertical issues and he's fantastic. So there's a lot of education out here, ladies and gentlemen. And, and uh, also, you know, when we, we'll put the feedback form in the end, um, if that's something people are interested in an upright regulation class on, on piano technicians master classes, yeah. um, if we got enough interest, I think that's a, that's a very interesting topic. I think I'm going to jump back here a little bit, make sure we pick up some things in the chat previously. First of all, there was a little bit of discussion. We didn't call it out in our conversation here of the CA glue that there's actually some odorless types of CA glue. And there's something called super gold, um, which uh, said it, they get it online from central hoppings in Billings, Montana. So that sounds interesting. Um, and then I'll jump to this question from Patrick Drain. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Question for Steve. I'll be spending some time with a customer's 1986 Steinway L next week. Customer is complaining about, and I've noticed, very poor checking. What is your checklist of procedures to optimize this on the vintage of Steinway and Sons? I'm planning on repinning repetition levers as a first step. Other aspects to look at? Yeah. Oh. You know, that checking can be really hard on, yeah. on Steinways from that period. Uh, one problem is that the uh, the hammer tails are too short yeah. uh, in relation to the height of the back check. So one, one method I've used to improve that is to actually raise the back check. Uh, you know, and this all goes along with Steinway's issue with sometimes the, the string, the plane of the strings is too high in relation to the action. Uh, so all of these things kind of feed into the problem, but I have gotten improvement fairly uh, cheaply and easily just by raising the back check, the heads of the back checks as much as possible. Uh, Within reason. Can you tell us your protocol for that? I use a uh, hammer, uh, like a vertical piano hammer uh, extractor. Extractor, you know. So you can you can set that up so that it bears against the bottom of the back check head, and just do this. And and get a little jig, piece of wood or something to put on the bottom to anchor it, and then push up. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know that it it does the job very easily. Yeah, I think Ed McMorrow has a method where he uses needle nose pliers and vice grips and kind of like you know. Uh, yeah, like that works too. Up, um, mm -hmm. uh, little by little, you know. Yeah. Only, uh, so that's those short tails. You only need like a. A, maybe a couple of millimeters further up to get it. Right, right. Um, another issue that you sometimes run into on those is the bevel angle of the back check is wrong. So you check the bevel angle by playing the hammer into check and then push it while it's in check, push the hammer down and see what happens. Does it get way harder as you push it down, like the point you can't push it down any harder, then that means the back check is probably laid back too much and needs to be brought forward a little bit. Uh, and that's the most common problem with, with bad checking, uh, you know, due to bevel angle is that the angle is too great. Ah, and uh, so, so what happens in effect is that the tail of the hammer hits the back check and kind of bounces out. Um, 
So th those are two suggestions that I could offer. Raise the back check and check the bevel angle. Perfect. Beautiful. Uh I'll move on to the next really great questions today. Thank you, folks. I mean, really, this is great to have good questions. Um, and so we, we've had previous episodes where maybe it's a little thin on what people want to uh, interact and maybe people are shy, but I just love the love all of the information you, you're asking for here. Uh, this one is a, looks like an anonymous question because I can't tell who the user is, but it says, what is your opinion of the effect of using some now, not, uh, now popular non-Steinway hammers on an American Steinway piano, for example, Abel Natural Wolf, Dirty Hammers, Ronson Weikert Felt, Renner Blue Point. What do you gain? What do you lose? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Awesome. Uh, and I've tried most of these hammers uh, on Steinways over the years. Uh, I will say that right now, my hammer of choice with when I'm rebuilding Steinway action is going to be the, the New York Steinway hammers. Uh, I just, I feel like there's a sound you can get with them that you can't get with other hammers. Uh, plus, uh, having once rebuilt a piano for a client and having used um, another brand of hammers and then years later having had the client complain about it, you know, that they weren't genuine Steinway parts. I've, I've just, I'm, I've gotten very careful. <clears throat> and, you know, I will only use non-Steinway hammers if the customer insists. Having said that, I love uh, Weikert Special Felt hammers, both the, uh, the, the ones made by Ronson and uh, also uh, the ones made by Renner. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, th I think those are the blue points. Is that that's correct? Yeah. That's correct. Uh, and I take care of pianos that that have both kinds on, and they're wonderful. Uh, probably my favorite sounding hammers of all. But uh, I like those. What what do you gain? I think you gain a longevity of voicing. They, they tend to hold their voicing really well. What do you lose? Uh, that's, that's a harder question. You, you probably do have some loss in power, but you know, I, th I think that these things are, are mutable. You can, uh, if, if you don't have enough power, you can always solve that with hardeners. Uh, so I don't think there's a huge difference, but uh, I, I have to say <clears throat> I enjoy all, I enjoy New York Steinway hammers. I enjoy um, the Weikert Special Felt hammers of both kinds. After that, uh, I have also used the um, the what the dirty felt, uh, natural felt. I, I've used that a lot on all kinds of pianos and, and I love those hammers too. I think they sound great. But I, you know, I think the bottom line is where are your voicing skills? Oh. Because if your voicing skills are great, it almost doesn't matter what kind of hammers you're using. That's exactly right. Exactly. So, so sounds like a good place to end on that. On that note, um, shall I move on to the next question here? Or we got any follow-ups, no, David? Just just fifteen seconds. Yeah. This is really the challenge, uh, Mr. Brady. This incredible master is challenging everybody that can that's here to raise your voicing skills. They who have the best skills wins in our craft. So listen. <laughs> and it, going back to something Ethan said earlier, I, you know, I try to do a little voicing on every piano I tune. And I would say almost without exception, I, I will do what I call spot voicing. Yes. I'll find maybe the, the three notes that stick out the most to me, one way or the other, whether they're too soft or too low, too bright. And uh, 
and I'll voice them very quickly. It does make a difference in the final product. Plus, it gives you practice in voicing. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun oh, in the past year or so with some of David's methods. I like the, uh, the tunnel of air. Yeah. I've, and I find that works especially well on, um, on verticals because it's, the hammers are so accessible. That's that right. It's so quick. And it just really improves the sound. Uh, but I like the other method too of doing the, I, I can't remember if you had a name for that, of, of just kind of going sort of like angel shot. Right, along the edge of the sacred area, like right. a steeple. Yeah, and feeling the felt using a fairly long needle, 11 millimeters, and, and just, just feeling it, <clears throat> acupuncturally kind of feeling it. If it's soft, you're good. If not, you know, you soften it up and then come back up and ah. It's uh, the less strokes that you take, the better it is for the hammer. Isn't that correct, Steve? Exactly, exactly. And I, that's one reason why the longer I'm in this business, the more and more I find myself gravitating towards voicing methods that use a single needle. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Yes. All right, next question. Yeah, we've got a lot of good stuff in here. Um, from Donna Bird, I'm not sure what this means, but maybe you'll know. Steve, are the hammers you were referring to with your special set back in the piano? And if so, are you pleased with their tone? I saw your video on the university tech session. Do you know what she's talking about? No. Okay, let's <laughs> just skip it. <laughs> um, all right, now I think we're jumping on to potentially newer questions um, that came into the chat. Let's see here. We got the non-Steinway hammer question. Do you, have you guys seen anything else popping in here? Your advice? Uh, one thing I will call out in, in, the, in the meantime is just to say, um, voicing has just come up as a recurring theme over and over again. It's, I can give this perspective as someone who's like looking at what people want from the piano industry, looking at people are a little bit afraid to do, um, something that requires, you know, for, for, for better or for worse, kind of trial and error learning and developing your own ear. Um, but it, to me, it be, it's becoming more and more clear that that's, that's something that, that the technicians of the future are going to have to get good at, you know, tunings, tunings, the basics, and then voicings is, is really the, the next level skill that you need to be a great piano technician. And um, yes, and, but, but get over the fear is, is probably a common theme. And that came up in some other lectures uh, that we, or just even some radio hours that we did, just general fears of trying things out. Right. And it's a, yeah, go ahead, David. Well, this is, I'm going to shill a book. Mm, My little yeah. sister is a very successful business consultant and author. And she wrote a little book, cheap and good, on Amazon called Be Bad First. Her name is Erica, E-R-I-K-A Anderson. And this book is like, gives you the freedom to fail, to try stuff. You're never going to be good at it at first. So you got to be bad first. And just kind of look at it, reshift re your context about what failing is and what being bad first is. It's the way you are with everything. Face reality. You have to be bad first and then you're going to get good really quickly. And um, d don't let fear prevent you from going to the high end of this graft because it does. And they who have the most skills gets to make way more money and have way more self-respect and peer respect. And that's just the way it is. Yeah, just yep. to integrate from our most of my recent lecture uh, with Carl Lieberman, just about charging appropriately and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't think a lot of technicians realize that how special that voicing skill is. I mean, look around at your fellow technicians, how many of them kind of know what they're doing or have a lot of questions around it. If you're the one that's investigating, you're the one that's testing and making trials and errors, becoming good at it, you, you also prob should probably 
feel totally fine about charging appropriately for that. It's, it's a specialized skill. Again, that as I look around at the general landscape of piano technicians, very, very few piano technicians actually can do it. So it means if you can, that's why it's worth charging for. It's a higher value because not just anyone can jump in and uh, do some voicing on a piano. I ask piano technicians and very successful piano sellers all over the country. I'm in touch with a lot of people. And I said, what's the percentage of piano technicians that can really, you know, take a piano that final, what, Steve, 5%, 10%, whatever it is, that can really make a piano sing, maximize its efficiency as an instrument. And they say, the highest anybody ever gives me is 10%. Wow. Hmm. So, so I believe it. We, uh, I, I want to just say we put a link. Thank you, Pooja, for adding that. And the, there's a feedback link. It's all a bunch of text in, in, a, in a note that was put in here. There's a feedback link if you want to add some feedback. Um, there's a link if you want to sign up for a uh, pretty affordable way of signing up for piano textures. It's a master class. is $39 a month is our lowest price. Um, cancel any time. And that link is in there. Also felt like adding a few links to Steve Brady's individual lectures. So okay. you can access those two with the subscription, but you can purchase them individually um, if you like what he has to share today. And uh, I'll just move on to the next question. And then maybe that's the last question. Does that sound good, guys? Yeah? yeah just okay. leave, leave Steve a couple of minutes to just wrap up. Yeah. Home, you know? Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me do this question because it's here and then we'll wrap up. Um, how would you add friction to balance rail key bushings? Previously, a tech inserted a hot iron to compress the bushings and reduce friction, but did too much. Piano was then stored on its side for four years, further compressing the felt. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any tips on adding friction to balance rail key bushings? No, well, that, that's a good question. Um, and I would imagine that there's some noise involved with uh, bushings that are compressed that much. Uh, I had an experience maybe 20 years ago uh, with noise in, in key bushings that had just gotten compressed from playing. This happened to be on my wife's Falcone, the seven foot four Falcone. Um, and we were hearing a noise in the action. It sounded sort of like the noise you get with hard knuckles but it wasn't hard knuckles, I checked. Uh, finally traced it to the key bushings. If I, if I moved them side to side a little bit, I heard this little clicking noise. And her piano was only about five years old at the time. So I thought, well, I don't want to rebush the keys. So let me try something else. So I took uh, a single needle voicing tool, sort of like this one. Oh, and by the way, someone asked, uh, can you buy these from Fazioli? I don't know, but I bought mine from uh, Jurgen. Uh, That's Piano. right. Piano's Forte Supply has them. So I used the needle to just, I, when, and I took, of course, I had the, the action apart, the keys off the keyframe, and I could see kind of a little half round place where the, uh, the the cloth had gotten compressed. I just went down the middle of the cloth to kind of poof it back out. And I, I did it on every one. Wherever I saw this little sort of divot, I just ran the needle right down the middle of the cloth in that place. And it took care of the noise. It tightened the, the key bushings up a lot. Uh, so now this is kind of my go-to method for, you know, a piano that's not too old and yet has some problems with loose key bushings and noise. And, uh, and the really extraordinary thing about this is I never had to do it again. And she kept the piano for another 25 years. Wow. wow. Don't ask me why. That one tip is worth three hours so, so I, I call this procedure rejuvenating the key bushings oh my 
God. Another method you can use if you happen to have the action in the shop is to use VS Pro Felt yeah. from uh, Piano Tech Supply. And you put that, you know, you put, uh, you put your key bushing calls into the, into the mortises first, but not all the way. And then you use a, like a little um, syringe to just put a couple of drops on each bushing. And when you've done that, you push the calls in all the way and this will size, it'll resize the key bushings wow. to, to the proper uh, dimensions and, and should take care of the problem too. Awesome. So, so, uh, so that's the question. Says, right? We're over time. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So, oh. Steve, just give us a minute on how you enjoyed yourself this hour and what it meant to you and just wow. anything you want to say, brother. This was a lot of fun. I mean, I feel like I'm just getting started. but uh, And I see a lot of questions that maybe haven't been answered yet. But uh, maybe we should do it again. Yeah, well, there's no problem, no question. I'd be happy to. I yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It's fun to see all of these faces too. Isn't it? Yeah. It's Hi, Carl. And Hi, see Sheila. I know. Hans Krebs. Hi. Hi. Donna Bird. Linda K. Paul yeah. Williams. And this, yeah. yeah. And Carl. And yeah. this is on the first page. <laughs> no, it's a nerd village. It's awesome. It is a nerd village. Yeah, I'm so happy to be one of you. <laughs> Thank you, awesome. brother. This was precious. Thank you so much, Steve. And, uh, you know, and I think that uh, the great thing here is that, you know, we're all improving our craft. Sai is holding up my book. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for That's the plug. Automatic shills, nice. Steve. Nice. That's how badass you are. You have automatic shills. That's <laughs> But uh, it's so great, you know, that we're all here trying to improve our craft. And it's a lifelong thing. That's exactly You never right. stop learning. Perfect. Mr. Great, words. great words to you sign off on. If you stop learning, you're dead in the water. I'll tell you yes, that. Yes, words to sign off on. Okay. okay. Very cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending. Especially um, thank you to David Anstern and, of course, uh, Steve Brady. And again, thank you to all the people helping out with us behind the scenes. We've got Booja and Tal and Ian and Mikolai and Daniel and Pat and Sarah. And yeah. Joe was even helping out for a while. He, he had to move back to Israel during the, this whole crisis, whatever. But, but yeah, thanks to everyone helping out behind the scenes. Thanks for you guys coming here, adding your questions, being dedicated, being engaged. Um, we're, all, we're all connected as a team. We're working together to... Uh, to make things better and improve our craft. So thank you. Everybody's a integral ingredient. All right. We'll start signing in. Right, next week. Yeah, we'll see you next week. Talk to you later. Good. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.